The following program contains adult themes. Some scenes may be too intense for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. What happens when a man trained as a police officer, the very person sworn to protect us, takes justice into his own hands? And how do we know where justice ends and evil begins when a good man goes bad? Anybody that would get in his way, he would eliminate. Uh, and this guy had no feelings. He was cold and calculated. He is Charles Bronson. He's not Manny Pardo. He's Charles, the real Charles Bronson. Death Wish. Of course I felt good. I felt great like I was doing a service to mankind. They have no right to be alive. Cops. They're human beings like everyone else. Part good, part bad. We give them a badge and a gun and plunge them into the brutal world of the streets. But what happens when a man schooled in justice begins to administer his own law? Perhaps an evil law. I'm Teresa Saldana, and this is Confessions of Crime. Tonight, we will explore the mind of ex-cop Manuel Pardo using his incredible videotaped admission of his own crime. We'll interview Pardo in his death row cell, where he brazenly states that he would commit his terrible crimes again. Dade County, Florida, was the hub of cocaine trafficking in the mid-80s. The county was glorified on television in Miami Vice, portrayed as a town overrun with seedy and sinister characters, sporting fast cars and easy women. Then, in 1986, over a three-month period, dead bodies began turning up. Six men and three women, the victims of dramatic execution-style murders, were found sprawled in their apartments, stuffed into trunks of cars, dumped in fields. One woman was beaten with an aluminum baseball bat and shot repeatedly at point-blank range. Another man was so scared, he tried furiously to claw his way through a solid wall before he too was blown away. It was a classic case of overkill. There was 52 shots used for nine victims, and a lot of these were headshots. The kind of a person who can not only murder people, but over-murder over them if there, if there is such a thing, uh, is a twisted mind. It's an evil mind. The victims all appeared to be drug dealers, and police suspected a turf war. Then came the surprise. Manuel Pardo, an ex-cop and decorated soldier, was named by an informant as a prime suspect in the murders. When I heard that he was uh, actually arrested for the, com for the commission of these homicides, I was shocked. I couldn't believe that there was one of our people who had uh, committed these crimes. He loved us so much, and he loved his daughter so much, that no man, and not the kind of man that I knew, would have destroyed our lives the way he did. It all seemed a terrible mistake. Manny Pardo, a loving family man, grew up pledging his allegiance in a series of uniforms, from the Boy Scouts to the U.S. Navy. There were decorations as a Marine paratrooper, a degree in criminal justice, honors in his highway patrol class, and commendations as a SWAT team officer on the Sweetwater, Florida police force. If he was guilty, what made him go wrong? There is discipline associated with uniforms, but there's also status. And Mr. Pardo likely enjoyed the status and the authority that goes with a uniform, especially uh, even beyond the military, a police uniform, a Florida Highway Patrol uniform, gives you very unusual authority. Police officers are vested with the legal authority to detain, to arrest, and to shoot to kill. Manny's career with the police department, with our police department, covered a, a great deal of territory. He, uh, he did work undercover for us. He was involved in shootouts. Uh, he worked uh, in uniform patrol, and um, he saw the seedy side of society, if you would. I had a child die in my hands of overdose, and uh, people that sold her drugs, nothing ever happened to them. So what, what are you supposed to do? In, in, in this kind of environment where, where crime is very 
is very prevalent with victimization is on the increase. Uh, the officer is faced with trying to resolve uh, problems for society that he himself cannot do by, by himself. He has to, you know, depend on the justice system, the court system, uh, the prosecutorial system. These kind of systems uh, sometimes fail. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Manuel Pardo uh, started out his career as an exemplary officer. But for whatever character flaw that surfaced, he could not keep up the standards that he had set for himself or that the patrol maintains for its members. Manny loved being a police officer. Uh, when they fired him, in his mind, he was still a police officer. He was still the good guys against the bad guys. And Manny is the type of an individual who is an authoritative, assertive type individual. So that had to hurt a lot. I was born to be a police officer. You know, because lawyers are a bunch of hypocrites, you know. The same thing with the system, the judges, the prosecutors. That's trash. They're ineffective, you know. As police began uncovering clues, it became clear that these were no ordinary murders. Why would Manny Pardo go against everything his life had stood for? Was this just the story of a vigilante who had given up on the law? Or was Pardo protecting a much deeper secret? Stay with us. Manny Pardo put up a strong defense at his trial. He claimed the daily horror of his job had made him snap. He'd seen the terror in the eyes of victims, and he'd watched while drug dealers ruled the barrios and made a mockery of the courts. Manny Pardo claimed that he knew how to make a difference, and so he embarked on a one-man campaign to sweep the streets of criminals. I killed each and every one of these individuals because they were drug dealers. They are element, and I, I, I object to the word kill these people because when you say kill, you're denoting a human being. And these to me were not human beings. These were people that live off the misery of other people. They're parasites and they're leeches. And they have no right to be alive. He is Charles Bronson. He's not Manny Pardo. He's Charles, the real Charles Bronson. Death Wish. Everybody, you know what amazes me? Everybody watches that film and they, and they love it. When is Death Wish 2 coming? When is Death Wish 3 coming? Because they think the guy's fabulous. His family gets raped, he goes out, he takes care of his problem. That's what Manny did. The only regret that I have is that instead of 9, I wish I could have been up here for 99. But at least 9 is a substantial message. He had his own sense of justice. The good guys versus the bad guys. We're not talking about traffic violators here. We're talking about trafficking in drug violators. Drugs ruin people's lives. They make them slaves. They kill people. They take children and destroy their lives forever. This was very important to Manny. His, he had his own code. And that was, if they can't get rid of him, I will. That's what frustrated me the most, was seeing the, our so-called system as a revolving door to these individuals that are arrested time after time after time or again by playing plea not bargaining to lesser offenses, getting parole and probation, and never actually serving any sentence or any, something that would hurt them, that would stop them as a deterrent to continue selling drugs. Pardo was determined to rid society of drugs and the dealers who supplied them. So he took drastic measures to make all of his enemies fear him. He wanted them to feel the pain that they inflicted upon society. He wanted to punish them. It was too easy to just snuff them out with one second, one bullet. He wanted them to be in fear. He wanted them to know what was about to happen to them. That was his psyche. Ten cents a piece for bullets. So I killed the first two, the two, first two guys I killed, it cost like a dollar thirty. And that's the prosecutor trying to make me like, feel bad, say, well, you know it cost you a dollar thirty to kill the first two guys? I said, yeah, that's a pretty good investment, don't you think? It only makes sense that he would, if he went in there to kill somebody, that he would, he would kill him. He would not leave a wounded person behind. And in fact, he did leave no wounded behind. Uh, he went in there on a mission, I suppose, that he carried out the mission like any military man would until it was completely over and there was no chance of it being reverted. I want to have the opportunity to express to yourself, to you, for you to understand my motive. 
what I did. Because I want my daughter to be proud of, of her father and my family to be proud of my father. Because the same way that the kamikaze pilots would crash their jets into aircraft carriers to take out the enemy, they had families too, but they were fighting their enemy. And if, that, if that's what it is, I advocate their ideology and I took out nine of these elements. People that will never sell drugs to any of your children, never sell drugs to anybody else. And this is called absolute justice, which was my mission. He didn't even scratch the surface of, of, of the drug problem. What he did was very uh, self-centered, and all it did was create a great deal of, of misery and pain for the victims' families and uh, a great deal of embarrassment for law enforcement. When the media got word that an ex-cop had become a vigilante, Pardo's name made headlines everywhere. His story clearly touched a nerve with the public, many of whom demanded he be turned loose and given back his gun. I was somewhat concerned that this jury might say, yeah, Manny's a vigilante, Manny's cleaning up the system, let's come out and give him a medal. If there was one person, one person out there who felt Manuel Pardo was right in what he did, the only thing I could say to that person is, you're totally off base. No one has the right to take a human life, and no one has the right to make up the rules and change the laws. Then, investigators began uncovering bizarre clues to Pardo's state of mind. He had a secret obsession with Hitler and the Nazi party, and took part in rituals inspired by Nazi beliefs. The purpose of the photographs is twofold. After I shot the victims, I would photograph them with a Polaroid camera, because as I shot them, all I'm doing is taking away their physical life. That's not enough. As I photo the, the spirit stays within the body three or five minutes after the person dies. As I photographed them, I would capture their spirit on film. I would then take the film, hold it to my house, and I would burn the picture, the Polaroid. I would set it on the, I have a special ashtray at home, an alabaster ashtray, that I would burn them. And as I burned them, I dictated, and I sent their, hell, their souls to the eternal fires and damnation of hell for the misery that they caused on the earth and that, while they were alive. But he told the jury that uh, he agreed with Adolf, some of Adolf Hitler's views, not all of them, but uh, that sort of turned off the Jews and the blacks on the jury when he said that. There was a lot of types of people that Manny didn't like. He didn't like gay people. He didn't like people even if they casually used narcotics. Uh, he didn't like black people. He didn't like Jews. Uh, and he believed that Hitler was correct uh, by killing all of those people that he did uh, in the Holocaust. The affinity or any person's affinity for a person as monstrous as Adolf Hitler would strongly suggest that person being out of step with normal procedures, democratic procedures, freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of religion, or any freedom other than the freedom to arbitrarily do what you want to do to anybody you want to do it to. Was it wrong to kill these people? No, it was not wrong to kill these people. Somebody had to do to kill these people. When you go to cocktail parties, they say, well, the drug uh, situation in Miami is terrible. Yeah, I wish they would kill the drug dealers, but who does it? Nobody does it. Everybody talks about it. The problems keep going about. The drugs are being sold to our children in school, but who does anything about it? Not the judicial system. If I'm guilty of murder, they're guilty of murder. And the judicial system is guilty of murder, not me. Manny Pardo had argued a forceful defense at his trial, but was he telling the truth? Was Pardo playing out a movie in his head in which he was a vengeful character dispensing justice? Or was there a different reason, an evil motive behind his gruesome murders? Stay with us. Pardo insisted he was sacrificing his own life to eliminate drug dealers, a sacrifice he said he would gladly make again. But at the trial, Police brought forward evidence that made Pardo's self-righteous claims ring hollow. They said that he was involved in drug dealing himself. The police even suggested he was a drug abuser, exactly the kind of person he said he wanted to rid society of. Manny Pardo is either a sociopathic lone ranger who believes truly in his twisted mind that he's made the world a better place to live, or he is simply a calculated killer motivated by greed and avarice. And I'm not sure I know which. And I look at him and I see a liar. I see a person who's trying to pull a scam on the community and on the victim's families, and I don't believe him for a moment, and I don't think that he believes himself when he's saying these things. When the evidence was presented in court, 
both his testimony and the physical evidence, it became rather apparent that he was not a vigilante. There was an entry in his diary book, which was found in his apartment, pursuant to a search warrant, which had an uh, indication that he had sold one block for $20,000, which he kept $10,000, and he gave a partner of his $10,000. When he took the stand and said that he was not a dope dealer and that he hated dope dealers and that they deserved to die, I asked him why this entry was in his book. A block is one of the many slang terms for a kilo. And I said, this entry sort of indicates that you sold a kilo of cocaine for $20,000. And his answer, I believe, just blew his whole uh, defense out of the water. He said, uh, I didn't sell a kilo. He said, I sold three kilos for $20,000. Are you a drug dealer? No, I'm not a drug dealer. Never have been. Have you been involved in drug transactions with any of the victims in this case? Not drug transactions to benefit myself, no. I think Manny started out as a gopher or a worker for Ramon Alvero, delivering drugs and or delivering money to conclude transactions that Alvero had set up. Uh, then, for some reason known only to Manny, he uh, decided to kill these people and steal their property, which led to his major dispute with his boss, Alvero, which eventually led to him killing Alvero and the woman who was with him at the time. Many of Manny's victims were clearly dope dealers who he went to do a dope deal with. When they happened to be with another person, Manny, without investigating whether they were a dope dealer or an innocent house guest or, or acquaintance for the evening, would kill them too because they were a witness to his original killing. I know when, they, when my sister, the autopsy, there's no, no drugs in her system. None at all. It's there for the records. I say, I don't care. For me, it's yesterday when I find my daughter. <laughs> because I find my daughter. And when I see my daughter, I want to go crazy. <laughs> because they got five. <laughs> five show guy. Guy and chop and the head. And no have a teeth. The mouth is one whole black. I remember. <laughs> I take it out. <laughs> I said, Sarita, Sarita, please talk to me. I had no doubt in my mind. I would never kill an innocent person. That I couldn't live with, you know? But one of these people, I go to sleep great. I go shoot for 20 bullets and I go to bed like a baby. The jury did not believe Pardo's vigilante defense. They found the evidence of his drug involvement overwhelming. And their verdict was guilty of murder. Manuel Pardo was a um, uh, dishonest police officer who became a drug dealer and a killer. It's as simple as that. Why he turned bad, uh, I don't think we'll ever know. Uh, many times, the policemen who do turn bad uh, do it out of greed. They see all the money around them, especially in the narcotics trade. How could Manny Parlo be so convincing? How could he lie with such authority in order to cover the tracks of his murders for profit? Was it simply greed? Or did Pardo fall prey to the demons he once fought? Was he an abuser of cocaine himself? Just looking at any person who admits to and boasts about uh, killing that many people, and they're all uh, drug dealers, when you think about such violence, you've got to think about cocaine first. Cocaine abusers tend to become grandiose. They tend to believe that they can outrace speeding trains, they can jump over buildings with a single leap, uh, they can run faster than a speeding bullet. They are smarter than other people. They are better than other people. Uh, qualities that Mr. Pardo has shown uh, some inclination toward. I'm not saying that he was addicted to cocaine, but that certainly would be one explanation. You're not dealing with a rational individual at the time that he did this. It's like dealing with a schizophrenic. One minute, they're one way, and the next minute, you can't believe it. They're a different personality. I don't think Manny's insane now. I think he was temporarily insane. Mr. Pardo did not snap suddenly, did not have insanity, temporary or otherwise, but basically was a, an angry person, a self-centered person, a selfish person, who became more angry as time went by and more bold and arrogant 
and daring and aggressive as time went by and crossed the line, or once having crossed the line, crossed it again and again and again. What he did stands against everything that, that we fight against. Manny took it upon himself to be the executioner, the judge, and the jury. Um, that's the thin gray line between sanity and insanity. I believe Manuel Pardo is just as sane as everybody else. He's just a criminal and a murderer. I never said I was crazy. That was my attorney who said he didn't think I was, I was, I was right in the head. But I never, ever have said I was crazy. But the shocking climax of the trial was still to come. Apparently you missed, in my opinion, the motive behind what I did. So be it. You found me guilty, fine. What I'm begging you, begging you is to allow me to have a glorious ending to this and not condemn me to some state institution for the rest of my life. That, to me, would be a degradation. I'm not a criminal. I am a soldier. And as a soldier, I ask to be given the death penalty. And I hope you give me the glory to at least end my days in a proper fashion, not being condemned to a state institution. There are some guys that go sniveling to the electric chair. I can guarantee it won't be Manny Pardo. Manny Pardo will smile before they throw the switch. He's one tough cookie. Did Manny Pardo go out and blow away some kingpins? Did Manny Pardo make a deep, discernible dent in the problem of drug abuse in Miami, Florida? No. The message is, I'm going to do anything it takes to do what I want and get what I want. Get it? Because you better get it. I mean business. That's the message. I mean business. And I suppose that... Uh, that became part of Mr. Pardo's message. I'm going to do what I want, and I mean business. And it was quite a nasty business. In the end, Manny Pardo's allegiance was not to the law. With his warped vision of justice, he became a feared and savage killer. Manuel Pardo now awaits execution at the Florida State Penitentiary. I'm Teresa Saldana. Join me again next time for a unique look inside the criminal mind on confessions of crime. The following program contains adult themes. Some scenes may be too intense for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Why would a father sexually abuse his own daughter? Can a mother live in the same house and not know? And can those unspeakable acts lead to something far worse? He's cold-blooded, he's heartless. John shows no remorse and probably never will. I just didn't want to believe that someone I married could do something like that. I wanted to satisfy my own sexual desires, and I didn't care who it hurt, even though it was my own daughter. How can a father commit incest with his own child merely to fulfill his sexual needs? How can he betray the love and trust of his own daughter in such a callous and selfish way? I'm Teresa Saldana, and this is Confessions of Crime. Tonight, we'll explore the mind of John Reardon using a startling videotaped confession recorded at the time of his arrest. And we'll also have a unique interview with Reardon, who talks candidly about his abuse and why he couldn't stop. A rare glimpse inside the mind of an actual abuser. Incest is a secretive and terrifying crime that strikes hundreds of thousands of families in America each year. Hidden away in outwardly normal homes, it damages children's lives forever. But John Reardon, a seemingly normal truck mechanic who lived on a farm outside the small town of Underwood, Minnesota, was not thinking of his daughter's welfare. He had married for a second time and had a large family of 11 children. But his eye was on his first daughter, Sarah. Sarah was only eight years old when she first became the target of Reardon's sexual appetite. And for five long years, Reardon continually abused his daughter. Now, an exclusive encounter with John Reardon. 
At first it was like, uh, once every three or four months. It was like not a real common uh, thing. But then it, uh, as she got older and as, as my perversions kept getting worse, it would become like a once a month occurrence or twice a month. And it just was unsatisfiable. I don't know. I don't think she told anyone this was going on. She wanted to portray that, that her family was normal, and especially her dad. My daddy loves me. My daddy loves me. Sometimes love is unexplainable. It's, it was a perverted love, and yet I still had the natural affection for her. And it was all mixed up. The reason that, that I always thought that John had turned to Sarah to meet his sexual needs was that the family environment he was living in was so dysfunctional. His relationship with Marilyn was just, you know, t terrible. In terms of family sexual abuse, I see that issue more of a need for emotional intimacy that the perpetrator cannot achieve with an adult and only with the child, and this is part of their emotional shortcomings. I think he turned to her for the nurturing that, that he wasn't getting anywhere else in the family, and he exploited, you know, what should have been a normal parental love into something that was really aberrant and terrible. Perpetrator will, will resort to any mode of behavior, from blackmailing the victim, i.e. with a threat of divorce, that it will be her fault, or to victimizing the younger sibling if she stopped in cooperating with the sexual abuse, to blackmailing or bribery. Did you pay her for those sexual favors? Um, in the beginning I did. Uh, towards the last she made her own money babysitting. She didn't want money. John Reardon knew what he was doing was wrong, but he didn't seem to care, and he couldn't stop. He was obsessed with sex. He went to great lengths to hide his dark secret. What I would do is I'd try to uh, pick times when the other children were involved in uh, activities either at school or their mother was taking them someplace. So I'd, I'd try to wait till the times when there was the fewest number of people there. And either that or it would be late at night when everybody was sleeping. And it would happen like in the bathroom area or some place like that where, where I could close the door and people couldn't actually walk in and, and, and uh, catch me in the act. And that's one reason why I was never really discovered because uh, I, would, I would make sure that it was in an area where I could hear other people. How was it possible for John Reardon's wife, Marilyn, to be unaware of what was going on month after month under her own roof. Were there no telltale signs? Sexual abuse isn't something that people do and let people know about it. They're, they're not gonna, they don't want it known. They want it kept a secret. And I know that people are going to condemn me and say, you can't live in a house and not know. But I lived in that house and I did not know. We as investigators felt that it had to be known by other members of the family. Uh, later, uh, it did come out that uh, possibly the mother had been told by a daughter. One bizarre aspect of John Reardon's incest with his daughter is that many people now believe he was attracted to Sarah because she looked like her mother, Reardon's first wife. Was he reliving some warped sexual fantasy for a love gone wrong? Sarah, he found as the apple of his eye that he viewed as being very attractive and reminded him immensely of his first wife, that he still considered himself in love with his first wife, and that Sarah seemed to trigger this and that the intensity seemed to increase as she reached the age of pubescence. The more I got involved with this incest relationship, the more hardened my heart became towards it. it. I didn't really feel any shame or guilt after a period of several years. 
uh, that didn't really bother me that much. I believe John feels that uh, that it was okay for him to, to have sex with his daughter. It was his daughter, and, and he could do anything that he wanted to do. I think Sarah always believed that someday her dad would change for the better. She always had that hope. And I don't believe that Sarah was afraid of me physically. She wanted to end the relationship, sexual relationship, and she was afraid of that as to where it was leading. But I don't think she was afraid of me personally. She knew that I wouldn't harm her physically. John must have threatened her, got her so scared that she wouldn't help. And she'd seen his temper many times, so she probably was scared of him. As Sarah approached the age of 13, she was growing up, and she wanted to be free of her father's sexual impulses. John Reardon was now confronted with his daughter's constant complaints. Repeatedly, they bickered and argued. But still, he fought to keep her from escaping his sexual tyranny. In a moment, we'll see what happened when Sarah finally said no, and John Reardon was about to lose everything. Stay with us. John Reardon would not stop his terrible behavior, would not stop his sexual abuse of his daughter. He used every trick to keep Sarah in his power. But eventually, he failed. Sarah had a lot of uh, gumption, I guess you could call it, and confronted me with the fact that I was ruining her future. She did confront me with that. She said she wanted to grow up to be a normal little girl, and she didn't want to do those things anymore. What was your response to that, Sean? I agreed with him. You know what was wrong? Yes. When they reached the age of pre-adolescent, 12, 13, Typically, this is the age that we refer to as the age of establishing autonomy and independence. This is the time they begin to rebel. This is the time they begin to assert their sense of uh, individuality. And because of that, they will be a form of trying to escape their own dilemma. I told her she was right. I said, Sarah, you're right. I said, we got to. And I always tried to make it seem like she was guilty. I'd say, we have to continue this, even though I knew she wasn't guilty in any respect. It was all on my part. I bear the guilt for whatever happened to her. John Reardon controlled Sarah's life, and she couldn't see a way out. Then, on May 20th, 1985, Sarah disappeared on her way home from school. She set off to walk the three and a half miles home, but she never arrived. Had Sarah run away, or had she met with a killer? I remember the, the night of May 20th when she disappeared. It was about 10.30 at night, and I got a call from Marilyn, and she said, is, is Sarah there? And I said, no. She said, oh, I, I thought probably she was there because she's not home yet. John wasn't very worried. That's what it seemed to me. He just thought, he just said, well, maybe she's with a friend or went home with another classmate or something. It was very frustrating because I didn't know where to look. I didn't know what to do. And you just, you, you go about your normal life, but it's always there in the back of your mind as to what happened to her and where she was and if she was alive. It's very hard to go through something like Over the next five weeks, an exhaustive search was launched for the missing girl. The entire town joined in and searched the surrounding area, day after day, night after night. Flyers with pictures of Sarah were circulated all over the country. John Reardon, a man who had secretly spent five years sexually abusing Sarah, was a very visible leader of the search. He talked tirelessly to local TV and radio news crews. He implored Sarah to come home. He pleaded with the public to phone in tips and leads, the perfect picture of a loving father. Yet after more than a month of searching, not one clue was uncovered. Law enforcement usually searches just an immediate area, like uh, three, four miles or surrounding where they think the person disappeared. What we'd, we would like to do is search at least a 25 to a 50 mile radius. John made himself look very good to people. 
And he did a very good job of it. He had the news people believing mm -hmm. that he was a very loving and caring father. He manipulated a lot of people in this community and the news media and the reporters. Six and a half weeks after Sarah disappeared, July 6th, her body was discovered by a farmer. She had been brutally murdered and dumped in a drainage ditch 25 miles outside of town. I'll never forget the day of July 6th. We were staying at, at the cabin, and my mom and dad came in, and they said, they found Sarah. And she's dead. They couldn't believe it. All of us officers, and there was four of us that worked on the case primarily, shared the same same thoughts. Uh, first thoughts of disbelief, and then saw thoughts of sadness. And uh, yes, it got to us. It was probably the worst night I've ever gone through in my whole life. To admit that she, I guess it was just like all of our hope of finding her alive was gone. That we knew that there was no more hope of ever finding her alive again. The community mourned Sarah's death, but they were also outraged. Who would kill a young girl in such a brutal manner? What they didn't know was that the killer lurked among them. Stay with us. The investigation into Sarah's murder was based on the theory that a random stranger had killed the girl, but no leads were discovered. All the information led nowhere. Suddenly, the police stumbled on what would become the biggest break in the case. One of John Reardon's stepdaughters revealed for the first time that her father may have been molesting Sarah. The focus immediately shifted to John Reardon, and it was the beginning of the end. Once John became the suspect, uh, the investigation naturally focused on him because everything else that had been developed in the first two months or three months prior to his becoming a suspect had been run into the ground and, and had, hadn't proven fruitful at all. It actually got around to a point where I just looked at John and I said, John, you've been having sex with, with your daughter, Sarah. Why don't you tell me about that? That startled him a little, uh, but, but not a lot. He looked at me and he said, Dick, and he used my name, Dick. He said, I've only had sex with her one time. I said, well, tell me about it. And uh, he told me about it and continued to uh, talk with me. And one thing led to another, and the whole thing kind of unraveled. The afternoon of the crime, John Reardon followed Sarah home from school. He was cruising in his truck when he saw her walking home, unaware of what lay in store. Reardon demanded to have sex with his daughter. Sarah refused, and the police believe she started to run away to escape from her father's nauseating insistence. Reardon, angered by this rejection, followed her, chased her down, and killed her. Next thing that I can remember is holding Sarah either by the hair or the throat. With what, what hand? With my left hand. Okay. And then, uh, Hitting her with a sharp awl. Oh, I stabbed her in the lower stomach with it. Were you just above the belt line? Uh, the next thing I can see is her laying on the ground, my blood all over. Where was the blood? The blood was all over her stomach from from the top of her neck all the way down. So I blood on her arms and on the ground. Did you hit her with anything besides that all that you had in your right hand? Yes, I figured I might have hit her in the throat with, a, with my left arm. How would have you done that? Like a forearm. Smash. Can you show me how you would do it? Like this. Like this? Where would where would have you hit her? Right in the Adam's apple. After you hit her that way, where did how did she fall or how did she end up on the ground? She ended up on her back, just spread out, and she was dead then. To sit there and talk to John Reardon and how he described how he killed his daughter. Uh, there was no remorse, none whatsoever, zero. There was no tears, there was no I'm sorry's or uh, nothing like that. I think it was a, a violent response to what he perceived as a rejection of the only meaningful uh, female relationship, at least, that he had in his life at that moment. John's life would have been over 
if Sarah would have come forth and told someone. And I think the anger and the frustration on her running, which she probably hadn't done before, uh, put them over the edge. And in that fury, and stabbed her and killed her. He killed her to stop her from telling. That's what I believe. He thought that she was going to tell someone, me or someone else. And, and he killed her to stop her from telling. The whole community felt raged. We couldn't believe it. This man had stood beside us. We had, you know, during the funeral, we had comforted him and his wife. And we had been right there. We had brought food down to them. We had offered any kind of assistance that they needed. And then it comes out that he killed his daughter. The community was angry. Uh, the community uh, went to law enforcement to turn John Reardon loose on the streets of Underwood. And they would take care of, uh, of the problem. Most people have have an idea, a basic idea in, in, the, in their mind, what's right, what's wrong. They were sent out uh, from their homes with, with morals. Uh, criminals have no morals. They could care less about what's right or what's wrong. I don't know if you'd call him a human being. Normal human beings do not do what John Reardon has done. Normal people do not have sex with their children and normal people do not kill their children. John Reardon did all of that. He showed no discomfort, no embarrassment, no regret, no shame, uh, no grief attached to any of these um, events that he relayed. I think initially John uh, didn't think he'd get away with it. I think he thought he'd be caught fairly quickly. I think as time went by and, and the focus wasn't on him, and it appeared that maybe he had an alibi that was going to stand up. He started to feel that, hey, maybe I can beat this. Everything that John did was a, a game. Uh, John would try to match uh, wits with everyone, uh, with the investigators, the, the psychologists, the psychiatrists. Uh, it was a game. Uh, it was a mind game that he thought he could beat each and every one of us. John Reardon at trial was the most interesting uh, observation I've ever had of human behavior. His behavior was very unemotional. He seemed to relish in what was happening, seemed to enjoy the attention he was getting. It's hard to explain his demeanor and approach, but I think that demeanor was as significant in securing his conviction, ultimately, as the evidence we had. I don't really think of Sarah very often. I really don't. But I just can't change the past, and so I don't, I choose not to really think about her very much. I miss her more than a lot of people even know. I think, I think of her very often. Yes, I miss Sarah a lot. I was so self-centered. Um, I didn't worry about what might happen. I just took advantage of her and uh, did not worry about the results. But I, I, I think in the back of my mind there was always, I knew that there would be a day of reckoning that I would have to answer someday. John Reardon is currently serving a life sentence in Minnesota State Prison. He has since married a woman preacher who visited the prison and he will be eligible for parole in the year 2010. Marilyn Nagel, Sarah's stepmother, was convicted of knowing and allowing physical abuse of a minor and was sentenced to eight years probation. What is truly sad about this awful crime is that if someone on the outside had known, it might never have happened. If Sarah had told just one person, a school friend, a teacher, or even her own mother, if Sarah's family and friends had been more alert to clues and signs of what was going on inside the Reardon home, Sarah might be alive today. I'm Teresa Saldana. Join me again next time for another unique look inside the criminal mind on Confessions of Crime.